Right, hi guys, and welcome back to the Cruel Corner. We're here once again in this wonderful ranty corner for all things Formula E. So, Jakarta in Indonesia, round number two, has come to a close. And what could be said for this race weekend overall? There were some good moves, some interesting battles, but... For Formula E, these last couple of races have been a really tame affair, it must be said. The battle up front was quite interested in this race in particular. You know, there were some good moves, some good overtakes, some fantastic drives as well up and down the field. But overall, the race weekend this weekend was a tame affair for Formula E standards. Not much drama went on, apart from the two Jaguars taking themselves out in yesterday's race, of course. So if you've never seen this series before, I award the drivers out a maximum of 10 points based on their race weekend's performance, and I go all the way down to zero if they have a particularly bad one. Take a look out for bonus points, though. They're sometimes an offer of some drivers that do something extra special during a race, and on the very rare occasion, but becoming more and more frequent, it must be said on this series, I do award minus points to those drivers that do something extra special but for all the wrong reasons. So let's take a look at the current Cruel Corner standings, then they're on the screen now for you to take a look at and see where your favourite driver is. Sam Bird, of course, not escaping a disqualification in yesterday's race after ramming off Mitch Evans. Could there be more disqualifications to follow? Could there be some final warnings based on after this race? Well, you'll have to wait and see, but as always, yep, yeah, that's the scoreboard at the moment, and I'm sure it will all change as this video progresses. So let's kick things off with the race winner, of course, it is... Hang on a minute. That can't be right. That cannot be right. There's no way. There is no way that happened. No way at all. It's Maxi Gunter. Oh my God. How did that happen? Where is it? Unbelievable. Oh, the turnaround over the last few races from Max Gunter in that Maserati. It's been tenfold, like... Where was this Max in the first half of the season? Where was he? We saw flashes of brilliance here and there where he had some really strong qualifiers and was running around in like third and fourth. He's like, wow, could be Maserati's first points. And then he goes and stuffs it in a wall or makes a silly lunge and crashes into people. You know, there was mistakes aplenty from good positions. So we knew that the car had pace in places um, and we knew that Max could extract the most out of the car but he just kept throwing it all away. But this weekend especially, but the last couple of weekends it's been building up to something like this. He has been incredible. He's been sublime. Paul sit up once again this race, of course, adding to his poll that he got yesterday. And then this race, he ended up bloody winning the thing, didn't he? And he drove so, so well. I mean, that was like a champion's drive there. And a lot of people are probably going to go, that's a bit dramatic, Josh. But... You watch some of the moves he made and the times he took the attack mode and where he slotted in and that was a perfect strategy from Maserati. He just drove incredibly well, didn't he? You know, there was, was there an overtake around the outside as well of uh, Dennis at one stage? Or did I get that wrong with yesterday's race? But either way, it was an impeccable, impeccable drive. It was... It was flawless. I was looking at that, you know, in the moves he made and the attack modes that he did and where he slotted in and out of it. I, at one point I was like, oh, like this, this is spicy. This is, this is the Max Gunter we love to see. And I so, so hope he can continue this form because these last couple of races, he's just transformed his career in going, I think he's going to get sacked before much longer. So, wow, he deserves to stay on for next season. And I hope he continues to deliver. Because I think the job he has done in the last few races especially has saved his Formula E career. Just this alone, but he's got to keep it going now. I'm not expecting victories for the rest of the season, absolutely not. But I need him consistently inside the points. I need him with good qualifyings inside the top 10 frequently just to keep him on the radar and go, look, I've improved a lot since the start. Because if he goes back to the ways of his first races then he's going to lose his self a seat easily because you're only ever as good as your last race, aren't you, in motorsport? And while this is a brilliant result, if he can't maintain this, then he will be gone. But for this weekend overall, it's been incredible. It's been perfect, really. It has been nigh on perfect. He's done some, some sensational stuff. And in this race, it was impeccable. So for Maxi Gunter, it can be no less than 12 points. 12 points to him on the Cruel Corner, and you can't deny him of that. That was just sublime. Congratulations, Maxi Gunter. 12 points on the Cruel Corner to you after a fantastic race and an incredible weekend. 
Finishing second place for the second race in a row. It is Jake Dennis, the bridesmaid in these last couple of races here at Jakarta. But at least it's good points for him, isn't it? It's some good points to get himself back into that championship fight after some dog shit races, some dog shit afternoons. But as we mentioned in yesterday's video, it's either podiums or pointless for him this season. So at least he's continuing the trend of getting podiums. I hope there's no more pointless rounds for him. But yeah, let's keep the podiums running, Jake. And this weekend, it's been a solid points haul weekend again. Um, as Tom Ingram would say in the British Touring Cars, it's been a pointsy weekend. And he did need a pointsy weekend to get himself back in that championship hunt. And that's exactly what he's done. Some good moves, some good overtakes, some great strategy calls. And he's just done really well. So for Jake Dennis, it's a perfect 10. It's a perfect ten on the cruel corner to him, and it can be no less than that because he has driven impeccably this weekend. Like Max Gunter, really. I suppose Max Gunter's just getting the glory because he's been that shit. But yeah, a solid points all for Jake Dennis and fully deserving of a full ten points. Bravo, Jake. Let's go get that championship, shall we now? As much as I want it to go to Cassidy, I also would quite like it to go to Jake Dennis, and I wouldn't be too bothered if Pascal Verlein won it. So, to be honest, whoever wins, I'm going to feel like a bit of a winner because I'm going to be supporting the driver that wins. Like, oh, you only pick the winner. I know, but deep down, I think if I had to choose between those three, I would like it to go to Cassidy, but a part of me with my British bias would want Jake Dennis to win it as well especially when it came so close a couple of seasons ago where his, uh, he was firmly the championship hold wasn't he with the BMW Andretti and it all came undone with a brake by wire failure on his car after uh, the main championship protagonist took the self out on the grid didn't they at uh, Berlin so yeah um, Jake Dennis absolutely full 10 points here and uh, well done to him Finishing in third place and making up for what was a disastrous round yesterday through no fault of his own. It is Mitch Evans, of course, in the Jaguar. It's nice to see him on the podium. That that championship hunt's looking a little bit too far away for him, isn't it? I mean, you never know, though. It only takes a crazy Formula E race where he wins and none of the title contenders score points. Um, you know, that happens once or twice. It could easily happen in Formula E. He's back on it, but... I can't see how it would always happen. You know, I, I know Formula E is mad, but I can't see it being that crazy for quite as often to really get him back into the hunt. But it's nice to see him back up here on the podium and recovering from what was a disaster <laughs> yesterday through no fault of his own. Mitch Evans this weekend drove really well, amazingly well, in fact. And, uh, yeah, it's nice to see him on the podium. Nine points I'm going to award Mitch Evans for that. Uh, that was a solid, solid drive. Top, top job. And, uh, yeah, recovered well from yesterday. So, yeah, well done, Mitch Evans. Nine points to you. Then we come to Sasha Fenestras finishing fourth place in the Nissan. And here I am with egg on my face because I said yesterday, wow, those Nissans were nowhere. They're not going to be able to turn it around in 24 hours. No way. If the car's dog shit at the circuit, it'll remain down there. I'd like to see him score some points. Bloody hell. They scored points and then more in between. I mean, almost on the podium. Almost on the podium for Sasha Fenestras. He's been incredible this season, hasn't he? It must be said he has been really, really good. There's been flashes of brilliance for him. There's been almost podiums here and there. He's had a pole position. He's been a great rookie, hasn't he? Has has Jake used, to be fair to him. You know, th those two drivers have done really well and really hit the ground running in Formula E in this Gen 3 era and probably started at the right time being a rookie. Yes, I know Fenestras had the uh, round at... Uh, wherever it was the last round last season, wasn't it, when uh, Giovinazzi didn't race. But, you know, as a, as a complete rookie, he has done really well. But the Gen 3 era making a clean slate where all the drivers are learning at the same time. So maybe sometimes it's better to come into a championship just on a regulation change because you're not learning or trying to unlearn anything you'd learnt in the previous generation of car. You're just starting from a clean sheet. The more experienced drivers are trying to go, right, I need to put that away because I don't need to use that anymore, but I need to use this. Whereas he's just going, oh yeah, I'll do this, this, this and this. And it's just all a learning curve. So maybe that's where the advantage comes in some places as to why these rookies have done so well this season. Um, but yeah, just... Fantastic drive. Fantastic drive by Sasha Fenestras. It's all that can be said. Nissan's got the strategy working well again. And they had great pace. They had great race pace as well. They weren't holding anyone up. They just did a solid job. So, yeah. Uh, Sasha Fenestras. It's got to be a full perfect 10, hasn't it? It's got to be. That turnaround from that weekend, from the, the race yesterday to now, impeccable. A perfect 10 to Sasha Fenestras. And if I didn't already have egg on my face, I think I've got a whole uh, ends worth of eggs or a whole hen hatch worth of eggs 
on my face now because finishing in fifth place is Norman Nato in the Nissan. No, 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 Norman Nato in the Nissan. So as if Svenistras just didn't improve, so did Ni so did Norman Nato. So proving that Nissan had genuine pace this race. So where they were yesterday, obviously got the setup completely wrong, went back to bare bones overnight and thought, right, no, let's just keep it simple. Let's not try and confuse ourselves. Let's just go back to what works. And it worked, it did. I've never seen a transformation quite like that in Formula E. It must be said when they're having the double headers back to back. I don't think I've quite seen it where a team have been really up there or really down there and then recovering to really up there. That's, you know, it seems like hard work to do. You know, you go to Berlin Temple off and the cars either do really well or really struggle there, you know. Uh, you see the double headers at Diria and again, they're either up there or they're not. You might get an odd flash of brilliance with an odd crazy race where you see someone in the top five that wasn't in the top ten in the previous race but to be from nowhere and not even featuring on the telly much yes in yesterday's race to this one here and now where they were battling really hard and Norman Nato in the Nissan no 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 he uh, finishes in fifth place fantastic effort by him great points all by Nissan recovered their weekend well and uh, finished strongly. So yeah, very nice to see Norman Nato in the Nissan finishing in fifth place. It's going to be 8.5 on the cruel corner to him because again, perfect weekend. Just finished behind his teammate, but I don't want that against him too much. Still an incredible race weekend overall by the Nissans. 8.5 for Norman Nato. Next up, finishing in sixth place, it is Pascal Verline in the Porsche. Oh, it's not quite a victory this time, is it? But it is still a top six, and this does mean he is in the championship lead now. Back to the top for Pascal Verline. Great to see, really, isn't it? It's been a long time coming, and the dominance that he had at the start of the season, you'd have thought it had just long carried on. But he didn't. He fell a bit flat in the mid-season. But, you know, it's not a great result this weekend, but it's crucial points that has given him the lead of the championship back. So, although I don't think he'll be overly happy with the sixth place and would have certainly liked to finish ahead of the Nissans at the very least, I would say, um, at least it is good points and good enough to get him back ahead. So, yeah, a uh, quiet one this weekend for uh, Verline. There were some good moments there, but I don't think the strategy played out quite well for him, did he? Uh, he dropped a lot of places by taking the attack mode late and then struggled to get his way back through. And he couldn't get back, find, find his way around the Nissans, but he did get a, get past a couple of cars, of course, Mortara being the main one. Was Mortara the move up the inside at Turn 1? I think it was, wasn't it? Um, it was good to see anyway, but yeah. For uh, Pascal Verlein this race, it's going to be 7.5 on the cruel corner to him. Because I think overall he did a great job. Uh, solid, solid, solid job. But certainly doesn't deserve to score as much as the cars ahead of him. Uh, because they did better job. So yeah, 7.5 to Pascal Verlein. Then we come to Antonio Felix de Costa in the second of the Porsches. So finishing side by side, hurrah, hurrah. Um, yeah, finishing behind each other. But de Costa this weekend... One place behind his teammate, that's okay. You know, it's not, not like a, there's a massive gap like there was last race. And, uh, yeah, not much to be said about De Costa, to be honest. It was just a, another one of those races by him, wasn't it? He, he scored a couple of points, scored a few points. But it's just not what he needs, is it? He needs podiums, he needs wins, he needs glory for Porsche. And, and Pascal Verlein's taking that at every opportunity he can. So, yeah, for Antonio Felix De Costa, it's going to be seven points on the cruel corner to him. Um... I think that's fair. I think that's a fair score. Half a point less than his teammate that he finished behind. Fair enough on my part, anyway. 7-2, Da Costa. Next up, it is the disqualified Eduardo Mortara. So we don't really talk about his race overall. But once again, his teammate's winning a race. He's down here in 7th. Not really that good, is it? In fact, it's 8th, actually. It's not even 7th, it's 8th. So, yeah. Good points for Maserati that he picks up a few, but there's his teammate taking 20-odd, well, 28. Does he even get fastest lap as well? So he might even be the full 29 points this weekend, this race, for uh, Max Gunter. He picks up four. Yeah, the balance there. I mean, if, if Maxi Gunter can do it, Mortara should be. He's not delivering. Disqualified anyway, so I don't award points. But, once again, points but nothing special for Motara. Next up, it is Stoffel van Dorn. After looking so strong in this race in the early stages, doing really well, he tumbles down here to ninth. And lucky to stay inside the top ten as well, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I don't really know what happened there. It just seems to be a typical van Dorn thing at the moment. Uh, yesterday's race was seemed, seemed to be an anomaly. I thought, oh, he's done well here. Hope he can deliver this for the next race. And he couldn't. He started strongly. But then he tumbled away, and we've seen this so much from Van Dorn. In a good position and fades away, fades away. Or sometimes he's just never there at all. But this time around, he, d he was up there, 
and then faded away inside the top four and just kept losing positions and over fist. You know, weird, strange one. They, they were okay yesterday. This race, not so much. So for Stoffel van Dorn, it's going to be a middle of the road five. Picks up a couple of points for DS Penske, but it's not what they need, is it? Not what they need at all. Five, two, van Dorn. Picking up a solitary one point for the Envision Virgin squad. It's not Nick Cassidy, no, it is Sebastian Bowemi. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Envision have not had a good weekend at all, have they? Um, the, their highlight was yesterday's race with Cassidy in 7th, was it? Here's, here's Bohemi in 10th, so it's a couple of points, but it's nothing special, is it? Especially when you see what the other teams are doing around them, securing big points constantly. Um, yeah, not a good weekend by Envision whatsoever. Probably their worst this season, I would say, so far. Did they have a pointless race at one of them? Can't quite remember, but either way, this is, certainly seems like a... a, a Bad weekend uh, for the uh, Envision squad and probably one of the worst we've seen so far of them. So for Sebastian Boehme, it's going to be a solid six. He picks up a point, but that's about it. A solid six to Sebastian Boehme. Finishing just outside the points, it is Dan Tinkton in that unlucky 11th place. There's currently some magpies fighting outside, that's what's distracted me. There's four of them on the roof of our summer house and they're uh, not loving life. I don't know. Oh. Yeah. Anyway. Finishing in 11th place, it is, of course, Dan Tinkton. Um, <laughs> that's going to distract me. But never mind, we're going to keep going. Uh, finishing in 11th place, it is, of course, Dan Tinkton. And uh, what could be said for his race overall? He was a lonely grid position once again, down in 20th place, I think it was. But made some cracking ground and gained up to as high as 9th at one stage but then just faded away to just outside the points, which is a bit of a shame, isn't it? A bit of a shame. Uh, for Dan Tinkton, this race, I am going to award him 6.5, and that's exactly the same score I gave him in yesterday's race, despite him not even getting close to the points. I know, I know, but you've got to look at it. You've got to look at it from my point of view. Boemi only got 6 for finishing 10th, and there was a lot better drives higher up the field. So, yeah, you know... Dan Tinkton did an incredible job, did a really, really good job to get himself up to the points and on the fringes of the points, but there was a lot better drives this race weekend. So, yeah, I'm not actively hating on Tinkton. Just look at the scores and look at the scores around him that there's going to be and realise that he actually had a, a fairly good score compared to the race, rest of the cars. So, yeah, 6.5 to Dan Tinkton. Finishing in 12th place, it is Nico Muller in the Apt Cupra. Much improved this weekend for Apt. Yep, there's no points this time around, but still close to it. A couple of points, a couple of places away there. So, yeah, you know, it's been a strong weekend overall. Muller finished 11th in the first race, 12th here today. Just a shame points don't go down to 12th, isn't it? But for the Apt Cooper squad, he did really well nonetheless. Uh, yeah, not as great as his teammate, of course, in yesterday's race, but still a good effort in one of the worst cars on the grid. I would say they are better than Mahindra now, to be honest with you. Um, but for Apt Cooper, it's going to be 7.5 on the Cruel Corner to Nico Muller for that performance because it was solid, but a shame it wasn't any points. 7.5 to Nico Muller. And just behind Nico Muller, it is, of course, Robin Franks, his teammate. The apps went in two by two. Hurrah, hurrah. Unfortunately, it was an unlucky 13th place finish, though, for Robin Franks after his great P9 finish yesterday. He's going to get seven. Again, he just finishes one place behind his teammate. Half a point less than him. That's fair enough, but what a great weekend. What an encouraging weekend for Apt. If we had the usual um, formulary craziness that we normally do have in a race, where it happens towards the latter stages, and the Apt Coopers were keeping themselves out of trouble, that would have been a double point score for both of them. I'm convinced, you know, it only takes a tangle, you know, for something to happen up ahead, and they're in the mix now, so that is really, really lucky and confident to see. So, yeah, fingers crossed there's more points going to come Apt Coopers' way. Don't expect it to affect their championship pot uh, potential overall. They are firmly last in the team standings, but nonetheless, an encouraging weekend. And it is seven points to Robin Frights. Finishing down here in 14th position, it's Lucas de Grassi. Oh no, Mahindra. I can't believe it. I just cannot believe it. It's just such a shame, isn't it? I just... Oh, I've, I've said it I said it all what I had to say in yesterday's race about de Grassi. So if you want to watch that, go watch that. But I can only award him six points, really. Finishing behind the At Coopers, which is what he's really racing around. 14th place. It's a place better than yesterday's race. But it's just not... It's just... Oh, it's just a shame. 
I can't believe how badly wrong Mahindra have got this car because they've been looking like good race winning team not consistently for a championship but they have been a race winning team in the past they've looked like they've built up some consistency over a few rounds here and there in previous seasons but this time around they've just not got it together at all with this car have they so yeah big big shame six to Degrassi then we come to Rene Rast oh dear oh dear Rene save your love my darling save your love um <laughs> yeah, it's not going very well for Rene Rast, is it? The McLaren's not looking great, but I don't think Rast's looking brilliant either, is it? And for that reason, it's just four points. That's probably generous by two, maybe. Uh, but yeah, four points to Rene Rast. It didn't look like McLaren had the overall pace this weekend, but certainly deserved to be inside the top ten, judging by what cars were almost in the top ten. Um, yeah, Rene Rast, four points. Generous by a couple there, probably. And we're probably going to have to start looking at seeing what we're doing with these McLarens, because uh, especially Rast. I must be honest, especially Rast, because uh, his, his form seems to have faded along with the car's pace, which isn't brilliant. So we'll, we'll assess the situation next time around at the US race in a couple of weeks, I think it is, and uh, see what he does there. And then we might have to start looking at potential disqualification, potential final warning. We'll see what happens anyway, but for now, four points to Rene Rast. Then we come to Jean-Éric Verne in the DS Penske. Lost his wing, damaged his wing. Not sure how he did that. Uh, no idea, really. But, you know, one of them things, it happens. Um, we didn't see a replay. It was just folded underneath the car. So, what can you do? It's going to be three points to Jean-Éric Verne for that race. Because uh, I don't know if it was his fault. It probably was. But that's racing, isn't it? Three points to Chev. Then we come to Roberto Mary, his debut this weekend, thrown in at the deep end in one of the worst cars, if not the worst car on the grid now. It's a shame, isn't it? He's been really thrown in at the deep end. And he's, at least he's kept going, though, hasn't he? He's kept going this race. He's had two more races. He's had pre-practice sessions. If they do decide to keep him on for the rest of the season, um, he should just continue this, just keep building the form, and just keep seeing how well he can do. I think that's all we can ask for. But for now, Roberto Mary is going to get three points on the cruel corner to him. Uh, I think that's a good score, really, uh, for a rookie that's in a bad car that didn't do as great as his teammate. It's just one of those things, isn't it? Thrown in at the deep end. I don't criticise Roberto Mary in any way at all. It was just racing this weekend and he really was struggling. But it's understandable. 3-2 Mary. Then we come to Nick Cassidy. Oh my God, Nick. Oh no, what were that? Such a lazy look up the inside of Pascal Verline there where you didn't need... He didn't even show his nose. He just sort of outbraked himself, sort of went for a look. Tagged his wing. His wing went under his wheel. He couldn't turn left. That was that, and uh, yeah, thanks, I'll, uh, I'll need a wing please. No safety car intervention of course, so he couldn't catch back up to the back of the pack, and he's down here only, you know, he's only finishing ahead of the cars that had real difficulties, so yeah, big, big shame for Nick Cassidy, and it was all his own doing, so yeah, bad weekend, loses the championship lead, this is the first major mistake we've really seen of him this season, it was such a lazy accident wasn't it, very reminiscent to Lando Norris at Spain at the weekend as well, you know, in a good enough position to score some points and just lazily tag the car ahead, damaged himself, ruined his race weekend, as simple as that, so yeah, for Nick Cassidy it's just one point, one point on the cruel corner to him for that, and that's the end of it. What a shame, Nick. What a shame. Then we come to Jake Hughes, who I believe may have been classified, but he was a retirement, failing uh, on the last lap of the race. His car was struggling, of an issue with the car. McLaren haven't said what, but he had to pit on the final lap of the race with a, pump, with a problem and retire. So, yeah, big, big shame for Jake Hughes. That. It wasn't in the points anyway, but he was ahead of Rene Rast, it must be said. Um, yeah, just an issue on the last lap, which is so unfortunate, isn't it? So, yeah, I don't think he'd have scored points, but it'd have been a more respectable race than what Rast did. The score I've given Jake is reflective of him being a retirement, even though he technically wasn't. And as you know, the maximum I can score retirements is a maximum of five points. And that's exactly what Jake Hughes is getting. It's more than what Rask got, which I think is fair, considering how well Jake's been this weekend in doing the best he can with the equipment he's got. As we've already said, the McLaren doesn't seem to have the pace. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the race overall, it wasn't fantastic and it did deserve a middle of the row five anyway. And I think that's fair. So, yeah, Jake Hughes this weekend scores a middle of the row five. I've counted him as a retirement. Maybe had he finished the race in the position he was in, which was around the uh, 12th to 14th area. 
it could have maybe got another one, but there wasn't going to be much more coming this week, this uh, this weekend, unfortunately. But yeah, Miller Road five to Jake Hughes. Then we come to David Beckman. Oh no, that's not what he needed, is it? In the early stages of the race, in the first couple of laps. Uh, he got tagged by one of the Mahindras making a move up the inside. The commentator said it was Degrassi, but I don't think Beckman ever got that high. Uh, and I think it could have been Mary that he tagged the two debutons this weekend. I think it could have been Mary that, that tagged him. But nonetheless, he, he forced him wide, and then Beckman obviously had a slap of oversteer, and then he slid into the wall, tagged the wall, broke his front right, uh, front right suspension was broken, had to pit, had to retire. It's not what he needed, really. And did he really need to fight that hard with? the other car it's experience i suppose in the early stages of a frantic formula e race i get it but you needed to be there building the laps building the pace and you know sticking a car in a wall lotra can do that mate you know he really can and he doesn't need assistance either so um that's a shame i think he should have just you know just let the position go uh, it was a late lunge i must be honest it did look late anyway from the one on board that we saw um did look a late move from whatever hindra that was but, um, yeah, just let it go. Just let it go. It doesn't matter. Just gain the laps, gain the experience. It'll be interesting to see what happens going forward, of course, whether Beckman was just a one-off for this weekend and whether um, it will be Lotra back in the car for the USA race in a couple of weeks' time or whether they do decide to keep Beckman on. We'll wait and see. But for now, David Beckman, as you know, a retirement maximum of five. I'm giving him four. You know, I, I don't want to be too overly critical with him uh, in his early stages in a in a campaign and a championship and in a car that is very difficult to drive and is completely different to anything else that anyone's ever driven in motorsport so yeah four points to Beckman then we come to the definite retirements although there weren't technically retirements there were did not start weren't they and this one is Sam Bird of course disqualified on the crawl room anyway after yesterday's antics uh, which is to be expected I'm sure you'll all agree and the reason why he retired from the race was a complete vehicle power shut down on the grid uh, he'd qualified a fantastic incredible 14th or something hadn't he so was very mediocre in that anyway and then just as they were about to do their rolling two cars forward trying to just get a bit of heat into those rear tires and just shooting forward a couple of grid slots his car shut down before that happened and uh, they were like yeah let's push it back into the pits they had the laptop plugged in for a few laps but they couldn't get the car to restart it was dead as a dodo unfortunately so yeah maybe damage from yesterday's race where he got took out by a rast and uh, tag the back of the wall maybe a sensor went down something so simple as that can really affect a complex car but yeah uh, it was a shame that bird didn't get to race but again i've got no sympathy for him after yesterday so yeah shame for shame for jaguar overall i would say and sam bird disqualified on the cruel corner anyway but that's why he didn't start a complete vehicle shutdown and then last on this list, of course, it is Sergio Sete Camera, who didn't even take the grid due to an intermittent vehicle fault. Uh, this one was the car just kept switching on and off intermittently whenever it wanted to. So it wasn't safe to put out there onto the track because they could have made the start. It might not have gone off the line. You know, you don't want a car getting rear-ended, do you? Uh, you don't want to put a car in a dangerous position. You don't want him mid-battle and then the car switch off. So, yeah, intermittent vehicle failure. So, uh, yeah, Burr's decided, no, nope, I've completely had enough, whereas uh, Sete Camera's car was like, oh, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. No, I'm not, no, I'm not. I'm ready, I'm ready. No, 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 I'm not. I'm ready, I'm ready. No, 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 I'm not, no, I'm not. So they elected for safety reasons more than anything else because if it was shutting itself on and off in the pit lane and just trying to get the car going, if it was doing that in the pit lane, it would have definitely done it on a bumpy racetrack, trying to overtake on a dusty part of the track and off the line and trying to warm the tyres up. It was definitely going to shut down then. So, yeah, shame for Sergio Sete Camera. And I can only score him realistically a middle of the row five for that car. He didn't make the start of the race. Wasn't it his fault? Uh, a vehicle problem. Um, and that's that. So yeah, five to set a camera. So there we are then, guys. Those were the runners and riders of the Jakarta e Prix from Indonesia, round number two of two. There we go. We got there. We're done. Thank you so, so much to everyone for watching. As always, it's massively appreciated. Let's take a look at the current Cruel Corner standings then, updated with the points I've just awarded. It's on the screen now for you to take a look at. See where your favourite driver is. Have they gone up? Have they gone down after this week's performance? Maxi Gunter will certainly be claiming a few places after these results, won't he? Much like he is in the championship overall. It's up to seventh. It's up to seventh in the standings overall. How 
How mental is that? After two fantastic races, he's up to seventh. That is just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But there you go. Such is the nature of Formula E. It wasn't crazy in the sense that we had crazy races, but the results certainly looked odd in certain places, didn't it? App Cooper in the points. App Cooper with strong qualifying in yesterday's race. A double pole position for the Maserati of Max Gunter. A podium and a victory. It was nice to see Verline back up there. It was nice to see Jake Dennis secure two podiums. Sam Bird and Mitch Evans coming together once again. So the, you look on paper and you think, wow, that was exciting. But the races themselves were a little bit flat. Are they better than Formula 1 this season? Absolutely, though. I'd take these boring Formula E races over the exciting, as we're calling them at the moment, Formula 1 races that we're having, because people said that Spain was a good one. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll skip over that. Thanks, as always, go out to Dan of Mushy Gaming for providing me with this scoreboard on this series. Without him, this series will be more pointless than it already is. And, of course, if you watch the Cruel Room series, you'll get to see Dan doesn't only do the scoreboards, he does the intro, the outro, the driver icons on the side as well. He's massively involved in this channel and a big, big part of the reason why I continue this series is because I've got someone keeping an eye on the scores because without him, this series would be more pointless than it already is. So a massive, massive thanks to him. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. I'll see you all in a couple of weeks' time for the Portland e Prix in the USA. And, uh, yeah, very much looking forward to it. I hope it's a little bit more spicy than these couple of races at Jakarta. But overall, I'm happy with the results that we've seen over the course of the weekend. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. And as always, much love.